Uh, hi guys. Uh, before we will go to straight to the topic, I would like to start with some sort of engagement. It won't be like a silly game or anything like this. Uh, but you know, after this super interesting panel, you know, I deliver some more cryptic and fringe topic here. So, yeah, bear with me. Uh, so I will try to start with uh, some questions, and you will have to answer. So that's important. Uh, so the question is, imagine the situation that you have uh, certain problems to solve. And you found out during the sort of analysis or whatever that uh, you have a number of solutions. Simple, sort of brute force, uh, but long-lasting. Uh, but you have more fancy, maybe quick, maybe dirty. So basically simple, complicated or complex and sort of completely random s solutions to the problem. So I would like to understand uh, what is your line of thoughts uh, in choosing solution to the problem. And feel free to sp speak. There is no bad answer in this. So if you will say, yeah, I just move on, whatever. Or I will just spend time over analyzing this. Uh, yeah, over analyzing, there is not, no such thing, yes? Uh, so, yeah, any volunteers to say something? <laughs> yes? So I would say maybe like go for a, so sorry. So maybe like go for a solution that has the biggest chance of taking the least time, like to solve uh, the problem. Yes, you might do this. But the question is, uh, and I think, and it's obviously silly, yeah. uh, maybe the answer, there is no proper answer to this because Obviously, that's the trap, sort of, for you, because it's sort of so generic question that you should ask more like, okay, what's the context of this? What's the actual problem we're solving? Yeah. It's sort of, yes. So I was, you know, trying to, hey, no, no, shut up. You shouldn't ask that question. So that was the response I wanted. <laughs> but, yeah. Thank you so much. It was f close enough for me. Uh, but uh, to be fair, why I'm asking this? Because I was actually struggling with this topic for like almost uh, 20 years of my either scientific or professional career. So that was always topic of my uh, concerns. So it was always how to approach the problem, uh, how to understand the context, not to screw up, basically. Because quite often you face a situation that you do something, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I didn't know the full picture, for example. So especially in project management, that's quite often, because that's notorious industry for this. But in game dev, it's quite prominent as well. So we quite often focus on a very small, let's say narrow-minded narrow solution to specific problem, ignoring the rest of the stuff. And basically, that's a line of thought that uh, brought me to this topic and to discovery for me, because I'm not an inventor of this sort of framework. Uh, Ken Evan, that's the framework that I will be talking about. And that's the Welsh word. Uh, so that it, it sort of depicts a safe habitat for people. So, so it should uh, invoke some thoughts of, okay, I'm here, I'm safe, that's the comfortable place. So, yeah, it's pretty cryptic. Uh, <laughs> uh, but obviously, with using uh, such frameworks, uh, there are other thoughts that we would like to consider, and I will talk about this and try to show my journey to the discovery of this, and how this influence, in some uh, cases, my perception of the situation, and in some cases, not at all. So that's the case. Uh, and what is important for me as well uh, is that whole journey, as I mentioned, is over 20 years of, of, of dealing with this topic, actually led me to Pixel and Games, which, which is the place that, uh, and th that's super important for me, because I was mentioning context quite a few times already. I'm repeating myself. Uh, and for me, context is a super related thing to being human. So 
everybody has different contexts. Sometimes it's cultural context. Sometimes it's a context that I'm working with or in this context. And what, for example, is for me a selling point in Pixel and games, it was actually this human-centric perspective on working on games uh, as, a, as a super selling point because it sort of clicked in with all my studies about the context, how to approach complexity and stuff like this because uh, there's nothing more complex or there's nothing more uh, disturbing to the simple equation than human. And obviously I'm from uh, sort of more like physics and stuff so I always despise humans like an unnecessary evil to the existence of the world. And after that, when I started to move to, towards professional career, I had to somehow accept existence of those things. And obviously, start to accepting, and it's not enough because you have to start dealing with this, especially if you're professionally uh, responsible for yeah, products of those things. So, yeah, here I am, and I'm trying to uh, describe a little bit of the journey, and hopefully at the end of the day we'll be on the same page, and you will say, yeah, it's mind-blowing, yeah. yeah. It, it won't happen. But who knows, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I bought few people, and they will do this yeah, for me. Uh, so we will start from this sort of... Uh, classical uh, approach to reasoning, because this is something that we should have always in the back of our heads, how we do reasoning in the real life. So there are simple stuff. Uh, so, so we have sort of general rules and we try to uh, devise a specific conclusion. So that's the uh, you know, general equation. You have specific solution. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Next is the generalization, basically, which is quite often source of all the evil. So I know something, and but I will assume that this solution is good for everything. Yeah, why not? And uh, I guess it's this one, this second, the, the third one is the most common in our industry. So I guess at least myself, I'm constantly saying, okay, let's have educated gas. So that's the key. So we have very narrow situation, very narrow understanding of this, but we try to make up something based on our internalized knowledge, uh, feelings, intuition, all of this, you know, complicated psychological stuff. Uh, and but obviously, reasoning is for us is a tool, simple tool, very simple tool to, and from in my case just to solve problems. But what happens when you have, you know, not the like life problem, okay, I have to go to the toilet and I have to pick one, it's men or women, and yeah, simple problem. But sometimes we have a bit more complicated problems. And that's obviously Apollo, for those into space programs, as I am. Uh, and these are obviously in history of humankind, we had quite a few challenging projects, but we don't have that much of the, uh, let's say, historical data about how they deal with, dealt with this problem. With Apollo, we do. And we knew, and we still know, hopefully, that it was a fail from the project management perspective. So it was huge success for humanity, but from the ma from management perspective, yeah, it was a crop. So, I mean, budget exploded, scope exploded, everything exploded. And so, uh, and why is that? It's pretty obvious, everybody in project management environment know that, that it happened because it was this. So, gun chart and stuff. And I intentionally put simply perfect because all the stuff in waterfall on or this simplistic approach is perfect, but uh, so so we assume, work on the assumption that we can do the decomposition uh, really deep. We can be certain that the outcome of our work will be X if we do Y, for example, or vice versa, or whatever. And that's a huge assumption, 
behind this. And, and obviously, uh, I guess most of us experience quite a few times that, okay, we assumed at the beginning of a project that there will be something, and in two weeks' time, usually, we already know that it's not. And imagine the situation of the project Apollo, which was quite a massive scale. And, you know, quite a few uh, factories doing stuff and research institutes, all those guys doing crazy things that nobody knew about. And obviously, it just it was only a matter of time it will fall off. And it, w it did fall off. Obviously, as I mentioned, project itself as a deliverable for humanity, it was huge success. We boast about Mars, uh, sorry, Moon till today. But uh, project, project management-wise, yeah, it was, it, it was crap. As every space project, military project, so those are prone to uh, uh, primal sin, which is oversimplification, which is known like uh, specification, which is known as fixed price contract and all that crap, yeah? So only in simple situation it works, in more complicated situation it doesn't. Simply it can't. And obviously it happened that, yeah, how to solve this problem? People were thinking and thinking and thinking because, yeah, if after two weeks time we know that something will break, so maybe let's shrink the iteration or, or time frame of the project to uh, to those two weeks or maybe a month or maybe half a year because previously projects used to turn, especially those complicated pro projects used to uh, live like 10 years before the release. Oh, we know those, you know, time frames as well in game dev sometimes. Uh, but the iteration came much before the, the, the agility or agile manifesto appeared. So, so it's also quite often the misconception that Agility means iteration. It's, it's not. It's just uh, so iteration is a way to deal with the student syndrome. So basically, that everything will happen at the end. So that's yeah, in the in the simple terms. So people introduce this, and they've seen significant improvement there. So control over the project scope and budget was much much higher, uh, but it still didn't solve the problem of delivering information from somebody that knows something to somebody that has to do this. So that's still a problem here. And uh, that was the source of the agile movement. So guys, especially software development guys, decided, OK, we deal with problems that are, you know, I, I know something, my friend knows something, and customer doesn't know nothing, basically. So that's a classical case. Uh, I want you to build me this, and, and what's this, and yeah, I will write down, you have specification, and after that, at the end of the project, it, customer is completely unhappy. So that was the sort of use case that led to uh, this increased collaboration, uh, not doing too much of documentation, because if it's not necessary, why bother? Uh, and stuff like this. So all the Agile Manifesto stuff, they kept these iterations because they were highly effective, and they still are. But quite quickly, uh, this beautiful, simple Scrum framework, because this was one of the initial ones, so let's say let's, it's quite pure in, a, in reflection of Agile Manifesto, it started to go down the route of uh, over-constraint. There is a thing called theory of constraint. So basically, that's the theory about uh, if you have the uh, complex system, like a factory, like a project, like uh, anything, actually, you can define as a system. And you want to evolve it somehow, uh, hopefully towards expected direction. You might have a situation that you put some constraints, and you either block the flow completely, or it's too uh, too broad and it just do does whatever it wants. So this is some uh, the, the funny analogy is quite often uh, about the party of kids party. So when you have small kids, it's usual it, it usually does work when you have some strict plan. You will go for uh, here and here and here, and kids will be happy like three years old kids. But if you have kids like six or tw ten years old. 
you can't plan anything for them. So basically what you do is you close them in, in a, some sort of box. You say, you don't go there because you will die. You don't go there because, you know, because I, I, I just prevent you from this. And here's the food, here's the drink. That's all. And maybe there is some landscape that will, uh, let's say, encourage kids to play. And usually these are the best parties for, uh, for, uh, for kids because we just put constraints and we allow the system to evolve itself because we don't have control over the scope at the, at the beginning. And if we think about agility, this is sort of what actually happens when we have a customer that comes to, or stakeholder that comes to, uh, to us and says, oh, I would like to do something. And what is this something? No, I don't know, really. If you ask questions, they don't know that. Because we, the part of the Agile process is also a discovery of what is the real intention of the, uh, of the customer. That's why we have all this involvement like product owner that is heavily embedded in the project in, in those methodologies. So and though, uh, by this, the team and the owner may, means customer or his representative put the constraint on the system and allow them to evolve in those two weeks iterations usually. Sometimes quicker if we want to have higher pace. So, sometimes it's longer if we have sort of set of enablers to do and stuff like this. But as everything in human history, we have to twist this somehow, just to screw it up. Mm. I mean, the intention wasn't bad. So it was uh, creation of this. I don't know if you are familiar with this. It's, uh, it's called, this particular one is called SAVE, Scale Agile Framework. And the intention is, OK, let's take this very undefined, simple, and working approach and make it more like if we have a lot of stuff to do, if we have to plan ahead and stuff like this, you know, just just show violation of every agile principle and put it here, and it will be that. That and it's actually quite popular because it does what waterfall approach used to do. So it gives us false safe, uh, false sense of safety and understanding of situation. It does this with different language and it allows us to sort of claim that we agile because obviously waterfall is super bad now and agile is super good now and obviously everything is not right so and that's sort of implementation of agile approach that is uh, getting <coughs> all the bad things from waterfall so lack of strict control and massive decomposition, those things that are helping us, and also uh, removes definitely customer from this picture. So there's no, you know, there's supposed to be product owner there, but it's so watered down that this guy doesn't know what's going on because it's starting to be too complicated, uh, too bleak for them to understand. So the, these are cases like, for example, stakeholders come in to some review and actually don't know what's going on because, uh, yeah, because we do some enabler for something that will do something for this feature, for that feature, for the, and customer at the end of the day, I don't want a feature, I want this. For example, in our world, it will be some, I want this experience, for example. I want to have that feeling from the game. So, so as I, and I'm saying this firsthand because I used to love this one as well as I used to love waterfall. And actually, I still love them, all of them. You know, it's like having those <laughs> crazy keys. Yeah. And th th these are those, you know. S sometimes you have to simply choose which one is better for the situation. In, in a nutshell, that will be about this uh, presentation. But obviously, <coughs> We have different people in organization, in industry, 
Uh, and I guess it's, it's important for me for you to bear in mind what is your inclination because uh, it came to me as a sort of un un unwelcome realization that I was a bit dogmatic and it was pretty painful, especially for others, not for me, because every dogmatic person is super happy because he lives in a world of his or her ideals, which is usually hell for others. So, uh, so that sort of diagram just for you to focus if you are dogmatic or pragmatic, because in the real life, if you, we look at nature, uh, yeah, nature is pretty pragmatic. They don't give a shit about, okay, if it's the, the I don't know, wolf or different stuff, I will eat it because, yeah, why not? Because I'm hungry. So the purpose drives them. We, in other case, we always look for the meaning of life and all that crap. And by this, we invent different things that will describe us uh, the, the, the nature of the world. What are the rules that are there? And that's the danger, usually the dangerous situation. And something that helped me a lot to understand and to process this, because obviously I am also the person that would like to systematically approach stuff. I would like to categorize things. I would like to do the decomposition. Okay, if yeah, I, I have to go with family, I would like to plan this ahead. And you know, after that, I'm ending with thousands of plans. If my wife will die, or my kids will go to this school, or my dog will eat my turtle, or something like this. It's crazy. But you end up with this, especially if you're oriented to, towards this sort of uh, let's have plan ahead. Let's do plan everything. And obviously, it helped me to understand, yeah, possibly I shouldn't plan everything because not everything is prone to be planned, simply. Because not everywhere, because what plan requires? Plan requires causation somehow. So cause and effect has to be linked for you to plan it accordingly. And that's the, for me, that's the root cause of this concept of complexity domains that will allow us to use proper tools to manage situations, to solve problems based on this classification. So starting from this, which is obvious, simple, uh, everybody would like to live in a simple world, and that's the domain where we have full clarity what is the cause and effect relationship. So if I will put something in an uh, ice cream machine, I will have this ice cream. So industry processes. I'm building a car so I, don't, I know exactly uh, what is the process. Even if it's ch improved sometimes, it's still very well known. That's the place for best practices. So, so that was, I guess, for everybody with some sort of exposure to project management, the, the, the term best practices is, you know, it's always beeping somewhere there. Best practices, best practices, these are best, industry best practices, yeah? So that's all in a simple, obvious domain. And that's also simply perfect place, which I will refer later. Uh, next, we will go uh, counterclockwise, so, so next is complicated. And here we have this the relationship between cause and effect, but it's not straightforward. So it's not like one step, simple process, we will, we will launch, we will have an effect. The relationship is one to one, but we have variety of sources that will contribute to get us to the effect. So usually in software, these are multiple specialists that will have partial knowledge, they will sit together, they will do stuff together, and they will have this solution. Simply, you know, software developers doing stuff. So these are the, and here we avoid things that, okay, that's the best practice, because there are no single, the same case again and again. Because if we have this reputation, it means that it started, became simple because we did it a few times, we can turn it into the production almost, or, or industry process and just repeat it, repeat it, repeat. So we don't have to have those guys here uh, inventing wheel again. So it will end up here. 
So these are good practices. So good practice might be something like, okay, if we face a problem, we don't have this in our records with specification, with documentation, okay, let's sit down, let's discuss, let's have set of meetings, let's uh, define set of outcomes from those and do the, uh, do the uh, analysis and respond to this accordingly and we will have probably working software as we always do. <clears throat> and those two domains, so that, that's the sort of classical dichotomy. So we have here something that is ordered. So somehow we can relate cause and effect. And here we have unordered domains, which, yeah, we don't know what will happen. But that's a significant part of, especially in game dev, that's a significant part of story. So next is a complex, and I guess it, for me it was sort of discovery to actually understand the difference between complex and complicated. Uh, and in complex problems, we don't have relationship between cause and effect. So we see if we would like to have binoculars and we will see the problem from the distance, we will see there is a cause, I mean, something happened and that, that's the result. But there is no way of, for us to draw the line between cause and effect because those relationships relationships are a bit more complex so you can have multiple ways to get to the same point so uh, there is yeah no causality as simple as it is so what we do here is we, we approach to this problem differently so we do set of experiments so we do probe we think about it and we respond based on the and the sort of small researches that we do it could be something like working research in the game development, for example, I don't know. Uh, we have a uh, LOD system for AIs. That, that, that's the example. Or we could have, uh, or maybe from gameplay something, okay? We have like numbers of mechanics that we, our hypothesis that it might work. So, okay, let's experiment with those uh, mechanics and let's see because we don't know. We don't know what will be uh, end result. So that's the, that's the area, that's the complex area. And after that, uh, at the bottom we have something that is called chaotic. It has, at least for me, used to have uh, bad connotations. What does it mean chaotic? It's not good. Definitely not good. But actually, that's a very good situation to be if you can control it somehow. So, because that's the place where you have all the innovation, all the novel stuff appears there. If you want to have something unique, you won't do this like, okay, my boss comes to me and you, you know, you have to invent something like uh, super AI, whatever, or, you know, the rendering pipeline has to be super innovative. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Innovation appears when you don't expect it, basically. So you do shit, and all of a sudden you have a diamond, almost like that. So these are places where we have those hackathons, we have simply space for people to free their minds. And that's for innovative companies, that's the most important thing to secure something that is called a uh, safe to fail environment. So you have to know that first of all, business is happy with this because obviously it costs money. And you, know, you have to be aware that, okay, if I will screw it up, yeah, nothing will happen basically for the business, for me. Yeah, I can do experimentation without any constraints, almost any constraints. Because without constraints, obviously, we have this, as I mentioned, this evolution of the system will just, just, you know, spill everywhere. And we don't want it. But basically, that's the most important piece for me, because I love R&D and stuff like this. <laughs> uh, there is this sort of weird shape here uh, that is also crucial. So, uh, imagine the situation that we work in Apollo project. Yeah, why not? Daydreaming. Uh, so, we have this waterfall, WBS, 
we know everything, yeah, we work, we work, we work, and all of a sudden it doesn't work because, for example, engine doesn't start. And you know, it's not yeah you know, like an engine that you put fuel there and uh, yeah okay restart it. No, it's, that's the solid fuel engine, so you have to build it. It takes half a year to build the engine and the, the rocket, and you know you just turn on, it just explodes, and if it do didn't work as we expected, and obviously it has to work, you know, directional thrust and stuff like this. So yeah, you have to start over. And that's the case of things being oversimplified. So basically we assume something, we assume that we know about the complexity, and we all of a sudden we just fall off the cliff. That's the cliff, and we fall off and we have to take an action because in all the case it will be disaster and that's also the area where we have to do the action first so sometimes it's a situation when boss has to say no stop or maybe there is a place where you as a developer or you as a producer that's actually there is, there is no rule for this but action has to be taken because without action we can't see anything so we do and we observe we do and we, and we sense and respond to this. So that's the, that's the area. All right. Uh, that's for you. That's a fancy cartoon. And it's pretty funny when you start reading this and trying to understand. It's messy. And it messes with your brain as well, which is you know, super, super comfortable. <laughs> uh, so that will be later. After hours, you can do this. We can play with it. Yeah, it's pretty funny for me. But I have acquired taste of humor. <laughs> Let's say that. Okay, uh, so I would, lo I would like to go from this sort of really cryptic place that I am to sort of more like down-to-earth place where I would like to be. So these are uh, sort of simple classification of what does it mean for people that are managing projects somehow or organizations that are setting up projects. So that's uh, for those uh, domains that I've mentioned, there is a different name, there is simple, but uh, as I mentioned, it's interchangeably obvious or simple and stuff. That's a place for waterfall. We know the case is simple. I'm not saying it's trivial. Simple means that we can do a relation between cause and effect, straightforward. So we have process to this. We can do the decomposition and stuff. Uh, we build Toyotas. We build maybe not Teslas because they're crap, but like cars that are driving. Yeah. We are getting too complicated and complex. I'm tr sort of mixing them both because that's that's the area that we usually reside. I mean, usually, I mean, in a software development. If we classify game development as a software development, which is. Uh, so these are places where we have sort of borderline between a pure Scrum, which, as I mentioned, is the simplest manifestation of Agile Manifesto, sort of taken to readable form, except from this, you know, looter uh, letters on the doors of the uh, of cathedral. And that in complicated, we have sort of usually a mix of waterfall, agile, and that's why it's so, people are so keen to use safe because safe is sort of crap mix of those. So let's take waterfall, let's take agile, and it could be done well. I mean, sometimes it works, but it all really depends on context, on culture of the company, depends on many, many things. So it's not that simple as in waterfall, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's why I mentioned it's simply perfect because waterfall, no matter what culture, no matter what situation, you take waterfall and it will work with those assumptions. That case is simple, causation, yeah, it will work always. And you can be in Africa, you can be in South America, you can be in, even in Krakow, it will work. But, uh, those cases are more context sensitive because situations are uh, complicated. For the research phase uh, or, or innovative domain, usually it's Kanban that is used because obviously we want to have some visibility. 
but you know we can't really estimate we can't really promise anything because yeah we we shouldn't because if we promise something it's the wrong place to be for innovation because we can't do it. that's why it's pretty funny i used to be quite involved in sort of eu projects for that are r d which obviously inherently can't be r d because we have to do the specification up front which obviously cancels any innovation but that's that's the way it is uh, <coughs> So what it that I mean what we have to do here because obviously business doesn't want to have okay whatever do stuff yeah, I wouldn't do this if I would a business uh, but what we do is we constrain it with time as well so we uh, allow sort of free, full freedom but okay let's have some sort of after the research let's define the output let's define if we can enhance it or not. If we put some time constraint, it should be usually enough for the system to evolve and after some time create innovation. And that's the way 3M works, is the way with Gore-Tex, how they work with uh, research. All those big companies, heavy innovative companies, or IBM, uh, those parts with R&D, they work that way. So, so it's minimal constraints, but some constraints, usually time constraints, and another constraint is the definition of a enhancement or dumping strategy at the end of the research. So that's the one. Uh, and here's something more, even more down to earth in our case. So that's a sort of example of phases in the production of the game. So we, in, in a nutshell, we have concept phase, we have pre-production phase, and we have production phase. So my sort of unfortunately wet dream is to have production super precisely defined so i'm just you know factory yeah assets are coming yeah and that stuff obviously it doesn't work that way always but that's the sort of end goal that i would like to be as a producer but the, before that i have to allow for concept to emerge and obviously we know that there are many games that are sort of not innovative and are still selling very well. So maybe not every game has to be innovative. Uh, sometimes it's, it's enough for us to combine things and it will be attractive. It's different thing is innovation and different thing is something attractive for customers. But still there is a place here in a concept phase that we would like to go wild. Because if we won't go wild, there won't be anything wild. There will be the next Assassin's Creed, yeah? I mean, just changing, you know, textures. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's attractive, yeah? People are buying this. I don't know why. But that's my personal opinion. Uh, so once we deal with this sort of chaotic phase and we do the pitch and we will do the concept phase, okay, we have sort of idea, yeah. And I've, so even maybe eventually somebody will say, yeah, I'm buying this. So we will go to pre-production phase. And here, you know, we have to actually starting to nailing down those things that we have to deliver. And that's sort of why I blended this in the complex and complicated, which means, uh, yeah, that we might use variety of tools there as well, because we have nothing from software developers' perspective, really not much, because nothing is defined yet. I mean, in the meaning of specification, in the meaning of game design, yeah, it's not there yet. But here, at the end of pre-production, we would like to have vertical slice, horizontal slice, at minimum. Uh, so something that will go you know, pretty solid, we could have experience, we can judge the game as a whole, and after that, we just scale it uh, so we know everything, we just waterfall, outsource. It's super simple, yeah? <laughs> obviously. Uh, it's not. But this, this uh, route is usually the most difficult. And usually th that's the phase that goes deep into the pr formal production phase as well. Because uh, usually we don't do 
enough pre-production phase in here because we have to you know do discoveries smaller one is than those in in the beginning so these are those specific researches like specific tech specific specific technical researches specific game design researches it's a little bit more difficult with narration and stuff and art is is not you know you can't quantify it that easily uh, but that's the starting point and the ending point we have full machinery working for example in a scrum environment and they just working delivering 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 we can review and stuff and obviously that's the most natural environment for all of us uh, and for me super important is to to understand that uh, sometimes it's it, we have to take lesser evil in the, in the meaning of choice of tools. For example, if I have team like, no, I don't know, 50 people, it's pretty difficult in a, in a time frame of a project to significantly change mindsets of developers. So hence, it's not that easy to change, for example, okay, we don't do Scrum or, and stuff and let's do waterfall for three weeks because that's my calculation from WBS, and it will be that way, yes? So the, the, the switching of methods of working is not that trivial. So, uh, so that's why the second point that is important in the stakeaways is that sometimes we mindfully choose the suboptimal way. So for example, if we know that our team has skill sets in working in the Scrum environment, let's utilize Scrum as much as we can because the price of switching and possibly upskilling guys to working in different environment, changing mindset, yeah, it's too high. Especially as we usually have problem even with changing mindset between those phases, which are completely different phases, not only because producer wants that, it's mentally different phase. This phase is the untamed creativity. That's the phase. Concept phase is, you know, we would like people to actually burst with ideas. Here, we have narrowed down those ideas. That's a different mindset. And here, we just have to chop, 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 chop. That's the way it should be. We shouldn't get, get that much of creativity. And obviously, quite often, it just slips from face to face. And I'm a daydreamer, so I know what I'm talking about, because that face is usually a nightmare for me, because it's boring. And for most of people, it's boring. So that's difficult. So that's why we have to choose quite often suboptimal way to deliver, to solve the problem, just to be you know, ahead of the game. Uh, and obviously context matters means that uh, we have to be constantly mindful where we are in, the, in those domains. If we see this problem is simple, okay, we don't have to switch to, to waterfall. But we can, as a producer, for example, we can approach this as a pro waterfall deliverable. So we can have this decomposition. We can be more, put a bit more scrutiny in around delivering this. Without breaking spirit of agility, we can do this. Uh, the, the third one is uh, essentially that it's better to, uh, to, to, to think that you don't know than, than, you, than you know. Especially in case of producers, it's always better to assume that I don't know, play dumb and stuff like this and answer people to, okay, could you please describe what it's all about and ask five whys or whatever method you prefer, but that's the, that's the better way. Because what, uh, what it does, it prevents you from falling off the cliff, which is the most disastrous method from the project perspective. Because I will try to go back to this. If you fall off the cliff, you go, don't go back there. There is no way. You have to go there. So because you do action, you do some analysis, responding to this, checking. So basically, you go there. Once you stabilize it even further, uh, you, you decrease the the complexity, you go there, and eventually, if you want to be there, you will be there. So obviously, even here, we can see that it will take time. So it's better to be here than here in the game dev, that's for sure, 
because there is no that risk of, of, of the falling of the cliff, which is the most disastrous way. Uh, that is the obviously trivial. Yeah, go deeper every day, you know, get interested, blah, 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 because I was talking about it. It's super important for you to get interested in this and stay in touch with me. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, feel free. I won't bite. Short question, what uh, lectures, what books or so any, podcasts yeah, can anything, you recommend? Yeah, anything Dave Snowden. Dave Snowden, that's the guy, that's the god. Yeah, I shouldn't say because he's dogmatic, but that's his mind-blowing, at least, you know, maybe my small capacity, intellectual capacity, uh, but yeah, he's really good. He's really good, especially if you if you're into organization in general. So they have uh, quite a few discussion groups that are super meaningful. Uh, so if you will start following Dave Snowden's work, you will find all the stuff, and it's pure gold. It's about theory constraint, uh, organizational design. So that's super super deep. Thank you very much. Any questions? I expected some provocation from the team, but yeah, it didn't happen. Yes, that's that's his stuff. That's his stuff. So he has a lot of work around also uh, because when it's stable situation, you know, everybody can handle it, but. Usually when this, this method excels is when there is trouble, like emergency, tsunami, flood, war, and stuff like this. So these are decisions making, decision making processes that are especially uh, good there. So that's why this method was, in, it was invented during his tenure in IBM, and after that it was taken to Air Force, U.S. Air Force, and uh, currently is utilized also by uh, British government as well to uh, crisis uh, management stuff. So, yeah, that's sort of caliber of stuff. So, highly recommend. I'm sorry? Yeah, because the production value of this car is crappy. I mean, you, 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 welding is disastrous you know it's suboptimal in the meaning of parts that there's too many parts of the body for example it's just leaking it's i mean it's beautiful and i un appreciate the uh that it initiated sort of revolution that's fine that's fine but you know it's like engineer knowing something try to do something and assumes that his knowledge will transfer seamlessly to stuff that he doesn't know yeah, so that's the case. Yes? Yes. I used to be a secret lover of SAFE. I think the scrum at scale, it, in basically, in general, that's sort of in the, the, the simpler, the better. Uh, if we think, for example, about what actually Dave Snowden mentioned about this, so, so if, and if we think about it, so scaling Scrum doesn't actually require that much of an effort. Just do different teams and focus on sort of isolating deliverables or product parts. Obviously, it's not that trivial in game dev usually. So Scrum of Scrums is usually more than enough to handle those in whatever scale. Uh, so I guess the closest one is less, that's the method. Uh, it doesn't have this sort of formality of, you know, release trains and stuff. So less is quite widely regarded as closer to, to Agile Manifesto than other scaling methods. But it's, it, it, you know, you possibly require this as if you have a team like 200, 500, 1,000 people. If you have something below 100, you usually just scrum of scrums is more than enough for you to manage this. But obviously, that, that's also a, 
a, a trap with agile methods in general because why it's not that popular in a in sort of thinking about it or, or sometimes it's despised is, is because people don't feel comfortable that there is no control because they assume that the control is the same sort of kind of control that we have in waterfall that I define something in the upfront and it should carry on but in, in ag agile methods any method actually it actually requires for you to be more focused on the product all the time and the control has to be higher higher level of control from customer than we have in waterfall so it's not like cuckoo that drops the egg you, you just actually have to carry on and just n nurture your kid or just kick off which obviously might be funny okay so thank you one more time <laughs>